Welcome everybody to this panel, separated by a common language, barriers to creating communities through FUN, fun words, alternative meaning, meanings and specialised terminology. We are an in-person panel and we've all forgotten how to be in-person panellists. So we're all <laughs> flying by the seat of our pants right now. Um, but we are located um, on Ghana country in Adelaide. So Nina Mani, my name is Tully Barnett and I'm Senior Lecturer at Flinders University in South Australia, member of the Executive Board of the Australasian Association for Digital Humanities. And it's my absolute pleasure and extreme um, uh, abs braced moment to be uh, chairing this session uh, today. So the session brings together our Adelaide based uh, digital humanities experts and superstars. We represent all three universities here in South Australia and the GLAM sector and the tech sector um, and national tech sector as well. So in our panel today, we have a number of participants. We have Jenny Fuster, Program Manager of the Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences Research Data Commons at the ARDC. She has a wealth of experience in, this, in the collection, management and dissemination of research and cultural heritage data and resources through digital humanities platforms, most recently as Executive Officer of Ostage. Under her stewardship since 2003, Ostage has become the most extensive national cultural data set on live performance. Jenny is acutely aware of the diverse infrastructure needs of the digital humanities with expertise in database design, metadata schemas, interoperability factors, resource discovery protocols, content management systems, data visualization techniques, ontologies, and digital literacy. And if you don't know what some of those words mean, you might be about to find out. Dr. Sarah King is the training and engagement lead at Australia's academic and research network provider, Arnet. She has extensive experience in engagement and training with expertise in research data and technologies in the humanities and social sciences research areas. Prior to e-research, she worked for almost a decade at the National Archives of Australia and a few years in a public library. She has a PhD in migration studies and is a little bit obsessed with the idea of knitting as a form of coding. Dr. Linda Pierce is a registered architect with, the research, with research interests in architectural sociology, adaptive reuse of buildings and human environments design. Currently, she is lecturer in interior architecture at the University of South Australia, where she teaches research and design processes to senior undergraduate years. Her misspent youth in telecommunications engineering and management consulting means she can work at the intersection of HASS and STEM. Appreciate there, I've gone over a page. <laughs> it's got to be at the back of this one. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, and appreciate all of their things. And that means that I've lost everybody else's as well. So, <laughs> excuse. Oh, look, no, we're good. We're good. Found it. Um, Alexis Tyndall is Manager Digital Innovation at the University of Adelaide Library. In this role, she works on university library support for researchers interested in conducting data-enabled humanities and related research through a mix of programming, direct support, strategic communication and in improved processes. She has project management experience in diverse environments, including working with humanities and arts researchers in roles at eResearch SA, and the Australian Research Data Commons before joining, joining the e-research community. She worked in museums and is passionate about digitisation, open scholarship and improving digital access to collections and research data. And finally, Aaron Humphrey is a lecturer of media and digital humanities at the University of Adelaide. His academic writing has been published in the International Journal of Comic Art, the International Journal of Cultural Studies, um, AB Autobiography Studies, Media International Australia, and the Comics Grid. He's published Academic Comics in Persona Studies, Composition Studies and Digital Humanities Quarterly and is a member of the J.M. Kurtzayer Centre for Creative Practice at Adelaide University. And finally, finally, is Dr. Diana Newport-Peace, who is a research fellow at Flinders University, um, whose bio does not appear to be here, but I know Diana very well. And she is, so she's a research fellow on several projects at Flinders University and is a um, grants specialist for, um, and consultant for outside opinion um, and has been involved in the digital humanities community um, for many years, including co-hosting the 2018 Digital Humanities Australasia Conference here in Adelaide. Welcome team. So um, language, language, um, 
and uh, and and fun words. So. Um, we represent the Adelaide-based digital humanities community, a strong community that has been operating together with different um, uh, processes of membership, different uh, constitutions of membership for several years in different ways. Uh, and we identify, we try to come up with a great anacronym, like for DH, all we could come up with is DAD, DH Adelaide, um, didn't quite work out. So we've just stuck with the, um, the Adelaide digital humanities community, I think. So, but part of our continuing mission in the digital humanities has always been to lower the perceived barriers of entry for digital humanities by being inclusive, by talking about um, the difficulties and failure and complexities of, of projects, of data, of community building um, and of, of publishing, of creating uh, ways of having your uh, published materials accessible. So, um, and so that's what we're gonna be talking about today is how does the language of digital humanities unite and sometimes divide us? Where are the barriers for entry that come from language? So um, Raymond Williams, the renowned cultural studies founder, um, published his first book called Culture and Society in 1958. The book was an exploration of the idea of culture and how the notion of culture has evolved over the between the 18th century and the 20th century when he was writing. And he is, he's famously said that the word culture is the most complicated and misunderstood and overly scrutinized word in the English language. That's up for debate, I'm sure. We're gonna add some more words to that today. Williams had intended uh, to, for there to be a glossary in his book, Culture and Society, um, but with a list of other words that are equally complicated and problematic. Uh, but um, things that are words that are seemingly every day, but when you get to the heart of them, you find that there is a distinction somewhere, some kind of division, a gap, a, a canyon between, between people when they're using the same words. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't until 1976 that Williams published his that uh, glossary in a standalone volume called um, Keywords. And with that publication came a bit of a, um, a, a focus on the notion of how keywords operate as a, as, a, as a discourse generator or as a way of uniting people around a language. If we think about the word keywords, keys unlock things. They are means of opening things up. They are entry points. Um, they, they open doors, windows, treasure hoards but they're also ways of locking things up. The plain English movement in advocating for language uh, if that is accessible by a vast majority of the public um, argues that we need to be thinking really carefully and clearly about the words that we use, our vocabularies, our discourse. The plain English movement doesn't seek to diminish the precise or quick communication uh, that, prof that a professional terminology enables, but it asks uh, right, how writers might communicate better with their diverse publics by using language that opens up knowledge. In the introduction to his book, Digital Keywords, Benjamin Peters examines the word digital from every direction, from its earliest meanings around fingers and toes to the algorithms that we now, that now, you know, go around, are around us everywhere. But Peters never stops to consider the keyword part of his title. He never stops to wonder what work happens when we determine what might be included in a set of keywords and what might be excluded in those keywords. So when we focus or reify particular words as emblematic of a discourse or a community, what are we doing when we're ignoring other words? Who gets to choose what are the keywords? And the keywords that we choose determine the architecture of our thinking. So here in this panel, we stop and give pause to consider the confusion, the hilarity, the multiplicities of meaning in the words that we use every day. How might scholars attend to this in their work? What obligation is upon us to be precise and technical in our language when it's called for, but also to be mindful of the way our use of language shapes our work and our culture in the digital humanities and those who feel included and excluded from that work. Now, over to... Sarah, 
who is going to um, tell us how um, a little bit about how this process will work. First of all, I'll just say we are each we've each got a word to choose to, um, to talk for a couple of minutes about, but we want to hear from the audience about other words, which of these words are the most um, problematic for you or the most inclusive? Well, what words give you pause and bother in your work for in and around the digital humanities? And in order to enable that conversation, we are going to use Mentimeter. And I pass to Sarah to tell us how we're going to do that. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I hope you like my choice of little Japanese robots not communicating very well with each other. So here we have the little Mentimeter. What you need to do is go to menti.com and use the code, which is at the top of the screen there, 63312826. And I'll move to the next slide. Hopefully that will work. And we have one question for you. And that is, what are your fun words in digital humanities? Fun being those words that give you the pips, basically, right? This is a little, uh, I guess, tongue-in-cheek. Tongue in so you have as many options available as you can think of. What I'd like you to do is add in your words. We will reveal the end of this uh, as we go so that we can then choose more words to talk, to talk about. Okay. Great, so there we go. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, team. Next week, so now we're over to start our interpretation of a few fun words. And our first is Jenny Fuster, who's going to talk about the word platform. Great. Okay, so um, first cab off the rank or first train off the platform, I guess. So if you wanted to find a definition for the word platform, logically, you might decide to refer to a dictionary for guidance. However, neither the Oxford, Cambridge or the Macquarie are of much help. Here we find the obvious examples, a raised structure on which actors, orators or politicians carry out their shtick, a shoe peculiar to the 1970s, a railway station portal to Hogwarts. Then there is a plan or a set of principles or a set of actions or ideas that forms the basis for future development which could perhaps be applicable to a research project, hypotheses or stance. But is that actually what we're talking about when we talk about digital research platforms? The Cambridge Dictionary suggests that a platform can also be the type of computer system or smartphone you are using in relation to the type of software you can use on it. Again, that's not too much help. It feels like an Apple versus Android app kind of situation. In reality, digital research platforms can be known by another bunch of fun words, such as research portal, virtual research environment, software infrastructure, science gateway, virtual laboratory, or my favorite, collaboratory. Can Geyser, Nielsen and Rossiter in their paper, What is a Research Platform, argue that the platform operates as a medium through which research, labour, subjectivity and knowledge are shaped in ways specific to hardware settings, software dynamics and the materialities of labour and life. At the ARDC, we define a platform as a set of online services often with associated integration and or orchestration functions and connections to specific data resources that enable researchers to collect or generate data, analyze those data and produce outputs that can be made findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Perhaps we should see if one of those dictionaries would like to include that definition. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so now we're just going to offer some responses to that from um, other members of the panel in the first instance. Anybody got anything to say about platforms? 
Well, I teach a, an undergraduate course called Digital Platforms. Um, <laughs> so this is um, uh, one that uh, is, is close to my heart. And of course, a lot of time people talk about platforms. My, when my students talk about platforms, they're talking about social media networks often, yeah. you know, <clears throat> um, which is quite different from a, a research platform um, in some ways. Uh, and I kind of, it's, it's a challenging one to, to get them to think about uh, in terms of, you know, is a, is a digital camera a digital platform? <laughs> um, so it is different probably than how the ARDC thinks about that. Indeed, it is very different. Yes, yeah, social media platforms, operating systems can be described as platforms. Um, there are many, many usages of that word and therefore the confusion. And I swear I'm not going to use this um, panel to plug every article I've ever written, but I have an article called Platforms for Social Reading. And in that, of course, I started by thinking about Google Books and the Hardy Trust and its, its platforms and Kindle as various platforms. But I had to come back to the question of if those things are platform, then so is an actual book. The actual material physical book is also a platform. And then you just go round and round in your head and can't, you know, can't, can't determine, get any determinancy there. One fine, one, one little comment. I think, wonder whether it's um, a technologically confronting term for someone who is new to the digital humanities, when some places, what we're talking about is a website with some tools on it. And if you tell them it's a platform, they will assume the need for a certain amount of technical capability to uh, find, to use that platform. So it's an inaccessible term for some. Yeah, yeah a barrier. So moving on, our next uh, keyword or fun word um, is user. Thanks. So well, I'm taking uh, the word user. I mentioned that I have a class called Digital Platforms. I also teach an undergraduate class called User Experience Design. Uh, so this is a word that, uh, that I've had to think about a lot. Um, and user almost seems like a really neutral term, right? It's, it's everywhere. Um, we've got user experience, user interface, user-centered design, end users, user-generated content, user profile, user ID, user persona. I'm sure you can think of others. Um, in fact, so what I've got here on the slide is what, uh, what comes up if you do a Google image search for user, right? It's uh, the easiest Halloween costume you'll ever come up with is uh, just wear a t-shirt, <laughs> right? Um, what am I? I'm a user. Um, <laughs> so this is one of those words that um, it, in kind of the, the way that it's um, taken off and become so ubiquitous is basically it's migrated from Silicon Valley. Um, but it shows up in education, healthcare, local governments, libraries, right? You have library users now. Um, so what do we mean when we're talking about users? I think many of us take it just to mean a person who uses a system or perhaps who uses a platform. Um, but in computer science, the word has a distinct meaning in history. Um, if you want to put up that cartoon on the, the slide. There we go. Um, basically, a uh, user started out as a word that programmers used to designate someone who is not a programmer. Right, somebody who doesn't write the code or make the software, but somebody who uses the software that they make. Um, so the obvious joke here is about you know drug users, um, but the analogy I don't think is totally wrong. There's a kind of arrogance in the way the term was initially used, and it's been critiqued as demonstrating a lack of empathy. Right, so somebody doesn't make something; they just use something. Right, they're kind of uh, secondary. Um, in the 1990s, there was a push among software designers and engineers to focus more on the people they were designing for. And this is where the term of user experience comes out, uh, comes from. This was initially used to, uh, it meant we should go out and actually talk to the people who are going to use our software. There was a push towards focusing on the user and having user uh, centered design. Now, of course, we have a lot of talk about user data user analytics. Um, and this means a lot of user research is now done not by talking to people, but by looking at the data that's generated on the platforms. And we've kind of moved from the sense of empathy to a sense of people, you know, users are these faceless circles with torsos. Um, so even though it's a ubiquitous term, it does serve to construct people, I think, in terms of their reliance upon systems that they don't understand. Thanks. Any responses to the fun word user? Yeah. 
I'm just looking at those um, users there, Aaron, it's really remarkable that they're all pretty much the same, aren't they? Right, because they're all they're, um, they're all they're all data points, and this is how we I think uh, on a lot of platforms you think about users just in terms of um, you know it's a field in a spreadsheet. <laughs> Wearing a glam hat and having worked in digitization and availability of collections for some time, if you're talking about making um, collections and collections data and metadata available online, who the person, the user is, really depends on what your job is inside the glam institution. So I sit at that end and I have for some time sat at that end where I'm trying to make things useful for researchers. Often the funding for those sorts of collections online platforms or whatever have an idea of the user being a member of the general public who just wants to look at a nice thing. And there's a vast spectrum in how you would design your platform or design your access point, depending on who you think that user is. Um, and those, those sorts of, the, the, there is no shared vision of what that user is seeing when you are having those conversations internally in a GLAM organisation. Yeah, and I think that's one thing the word user does is it kind of obfuscates those differences. So um, it, it makes it so that we can all be talking about different things and calling them users when we meet what we mean is different types of people. Um, over to Alexis for interoperability. Okay, hi. Um, I've got interoperability as my word. Um, I. Look, interoperability is um, the, I've, I've got a definition up there. It says the move, movement and alignment of data created or housed in one space with like or different data from another source. Actually, I think that's my definition, not the one that's on the version of the slide there. In an environment where platforms and linked up infrastructure are flavour of the month and the failings of data silos are well known, interoperability is a fundamental principle to realise the research value of any data. Um, in an environment where we're calling for data reuse, for the utility of data in contexts other than that where it was created, and where we have ambitions for interdisciplinary collaboration and the value of enabling and formalising multiple perspectives on data, interoperability is a highly desirable characteristic. I'm a bit whistly here. So um, <laughs> the strictest interpretations of interoperability, as outlined and agreed in the Force 11 definition of FAIR, a group of principles that were agreed by the scientific community designed to enable the optimal use and reuse of scientific data and published in Nature in 2016 calls for machine actionable data and metadata, data and metadata within the data object being syntactically passable and semantically machine accessible as well as utilising shared vocabularies and ontologies. That's pretty specific. Um, as an advocate of open scholarship, but with someone as someone who is grounded in a solid understanding of the responsibilities associated with creating, managing and sharing data about people and culture. I'm really, I'm really comfy with the concept that being fair, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable is a spectrum. You are not perfectly fair or not fair. There is a lot of grades along that way. You do not, your data does not need to be open to be fair. And like environmentalism and pandemic mask wearing, it's better for open scholarship for the majority of people to do an average job of it most of the time than for a tiny minority of people to do it perfectly all the time. So when we apply this to interoperability though, I think one of the confusions comes is that there's too much dispersion of responsibility. In the process of research, many players are responsible parts of creating the conditions for interoperability. The data, cura the data creator, when they choose to adopt discipline agreed data structures, when they think about the, whether how open their data should be or could be, their relationship with their stakeholders with their data, and when they choose non-proprietary formats for, for managing their data. <clears throat> the institutional support or lack of that might encourage them to share their work in an institutional repository or the publisher who might compel them to. Um, institutional support who might or might not make their metadata accessible to data aggregators who make it discoverable, and then the various links in the chain that might take it from discoverability to machine actionability. All sounds great, and actually various links in that chain are really good at creating the conditions for interoperability, but I think between the two extremes of burned to a CD and gathering dust on a corner of your office shelf, to aggregated, discoverable and machine readable. There's also a pretty big spectrum. And while many of those points along that spectrum, as I mentioned, are very good at creating conditions for interoperability, if you look at this picture, no one's acting as the pegboard. This is how we arrive at a situation where many people harbour a belief 
that their belief that their material is interoperable and will state that it is, but where the dream of interoperability remains unrealised. Interoperability is a really tricky one when it comes to digital humanities because so many circumstances we're talking about material that has um, personal sensitive, cultural sensitivities and those sorts of things. But I would argue that the benefits of making data interoperable apply far more to the pure notion of open data sharing. It can ensure your data reuse by yourself. It can ensure your ease of sharing it back to stakeholder communities and source communities. Um, and in an environment where the establishment of web-based tools is speeding ahead and there's ever increasing recognition of the research potential when new and different kinds of digital resources can be brought together, either in an open forum or in a closed forum, we run the risk of missed opportunity if we aren't embracing the concept of interoperability. Brilliant. Anyone got any comments on that? I love the idea of the spectrum of interoperability. Um, I hope you're going to publish that or, yeah, because I think that that's a, you know, a really interesting way of thinking about it because, you know, if we, if, if we're, if we're going for gold standard interoperability all the time, then you just give up and go, well, you know, we can't get there. But if you, if it's a spectrum and you might actually be able to progress along the spectrum over, over phases of your project, then that's achievable. I think the, um, the benchmark shift as well. <clears throat> I remember, uh, you know, 15 years ago, running around a university that I worked for trying to find somewhere that would read zip disks. Um, and just the other week, I was running around the university trying to find somewhere that would read um, a DVD. <laughs> it was actually very challenging. Um, so there's a, there's a spectrum, or even to play a Blu-ray. I had a heck of a time playing a Blu-ray. Our next word, oh, should we look on? No, we're just asking for feedback from the panelists at this stage. Uh, our next keyword is me talking about text. So .txt, it's a file um, in plain Tully, text. Yes. Sorry, sorry. I just saw in the chat, people were saying they were getting microphone feedback. I wonder, because this room is mic'd, can you guys hear us? We tested we before and it was it. seen to be better if we were mic'd. Do you think maybe if we all move forward a little bit, it'll be less, slightly better? Um, text. Uh, it's a it's a file format, plain text format without word processor bloat. It's that which enables text analytics. Definitions of text analysis don't help us figure out what text is. They say text analysis is a methodology to find patterns in a text or set of texts. Great, but what's a text? Cultural studies understands text as anything uh, that conveys meaning. So visual media, fashion is a text. Donald Trump's skin tone, tan tone is a text. Uh, everything is a text. Uh, but now we're back to that Raymond Williams definition of culture. Text is a form of phone communication that you can send um, between, between people. Text is um, print, text is not print, text is anything and everything. The original Blackwell Companion to Digital Humanities, 2004, and if you were at the social session yesterday, maybe uh, about, about um, Australasian DH law, um, that there's a marker in thinking about when humanities computing as a term ticked over to digital humanities. I think it was um, it was set in stone a little bit more by the publication of the Blackwell Companion to Digital Humanities in 2004, edited by Susan Shreveman, Ray Siemens and John Unsworth. Um, that text points to the textual beginnings of DH and its early computer-based concordance projects, and um, which I shall not name for fear of engaging bingo hurrahs. Um, DH remains deeply interested in text, but as advances in technology have made it first possible, then trivial to capture, manipulate and process other media, the field has redefined itself to embrace the full range of multimedia. Chapter one. So, um, so we move. So we move beyond the text itself towards hypertext, context, urtext, paratext, hyperparatextuality. That's another plug for one of my articles. Textuality: the last but one text. No non-textual forms. Semi-textual is something that came up when I did a find for text in some DH books into texts. So, so there, is, there is so much playing with this word text in digital humanities that we might just have to give up and go back to lorem ipsum as text. 
Any comments? <laughs> what is a text? Yeah, and I mean, I guess the, the key point here is that every discipline has a different definition of the word text. And when you're operating within an interdisciplinary space like tech, like um, digital humanities, then we have to be attendant to both those, all of those um, different understandings of what is a text, but also the possibilities that are generated when we collaborate together across those de definitions, but also when we, um, the, 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 the gaps that might be initiated by assuming that everybody understands what a text is and has the same definition of it. I'll just say that um, oh, <clears throat> this, maybe if I move over here. Yeah, um, yeah as in the, whoa, nope. okay, that doesn't <laughs> work. As, as, I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> yeah. Is that better or is it just me? I think it's me. Yeah. Right, okay, how's that? Yeah. <laughs> as somebody who studies media, of course, this is, this is, oh, hello, hello. <laughs> Now I just feel weird. Everything's a text, right? But it's, but like I study comics and a comic book, of course, is a text, but it's also extremely, it's a hypertext that's linked within itself and it's composed of a bunch of different paratexts. So what is a text and what is a, not a text entirely depends on your perspective. Um, and I don't know if that's, that makes things subtextual or something. <laughs> Um, just in case my sarcastic expression, my face doesn't come across in the tiny window, I'm being sarcastic. Um, but isn't text just a whole bunch of words that a data scientist can take apart and have no relationship with each other? <laughs> take apart is a nice way, uh, or mining, which has many different kind of um, permutations. I can just, I can run, once remember sitting around in the early days of Adelaide's um, digital humanities um, moments, sitting around POS with some various um, early e-research people and they just were like, what have you got for us to mind? They didn't care what it was. They didn't care what its context was, whose who's, um, data it was. It was just what have you got that we can rip out from your hands and mine. I'm going to redeem myself with the community and go tally. <laughs> Having um, in my role, I get a lovely opportunity to talk to data scientists and mathematicians, and I think they've come a, a bit of a way. 100% <laughs> agree. 100% <laughs> agree. That's why I said many times it was the very early days. Moving on to our next session, we're having a little break without between our words, and we are now going to ask the audience a question. So can you share any times that you've encountered confusion as a result of jargon? And you might want to respond via chat, you might want to talk into the mic, and we have two audience members in the room who might also want to say something. All of these methods of communication is fine, and we'll scroll up in the chat um, in order to see if there was discussion about anything other than the microphone. <laughs> Can we put the Menti code into the chat? The Menti code. Oh, it's, is that the link? Yeah. Yeah. So what words, what, um, what, what, can you share some key times that you have encountered confusion as a result of jargon, either in the digital humanities or beyond it? While we wait for that, we might. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, I've got one that I almost chose it for my word today, and it's the word ontology. And <laughs> when you, yeah, when you introduced me, Tally, you mentioned that I do work in grant review, and I reviewed a grant by a computer scientist talking about ontology, and I didn't know the computer science use of the term which made me look rather uninformed <laughs> I think I got away with it on that occasion but you know with a background in humanities that's the the notion of ontology seems to me is so far removed from what computer science uses the term to mean that I had to do quite a lot of work to understand how they got there I'm, I'm still not quite sure how they got there actually but I think I know what they mean so if you mean exactly how they got there I might have an answer to that I don't I, and I don't know if this is a hundred percent true or not but I'm doing a little project um, around artificial intelligence and 
published authors' works. And I'm working with the science fiction novelist, Sean Williams, um, New York Times bestseller, um, who has uh, who, who has a collection of works that we might use to train an AI in order to um, maybe replicate a Sean Williams style of writing that a um, artificial intelligence might produce some writing with. Uh, and in that project, we're working with uh, AI scientists at um, Flinders University and um, David Power uh, says that in the 70s he was studying linguistics and computer science and he introduced the word ontologies to computer science back then. So if yours was a literal question, how did it get there? We've got an answer. For the benefit of those who might not have read those articles, can you characterise the difference in computer science versus humanities use of that word? No. <laughs> Where is a linguist when you need one? So calling Simon Musgrave. <laughs> I think um, I could be wrong here, but uh, my understanding is in humanities on ontology is is a system of knowledge, right? So it's a worldview. Um, and in computer science, an ontology is a way of classifying something. So I think this actually comes up to the, the idea of text, what's a text and what, what's not a text. It depends in both humanities and computer science on your ontological point of view. So if you're looking at a, at a comic book, for example, as I sometimes do, whether your primary text is an issue, a panel, a word balloon, a whole series, right? These are all different ontologies, um, which I think is a way of thinking about it, which works across both disciplines. Although I think the humanities is able to use ontologies in a way that's not quite as literal um, and, and to look at uh, some kind of more subtle <laughs> nuances in what a system of meaning is. Any other instances where we have encountered confusion as a result of jargon? Any other particular? Oh, great. Do I have to be on the camera? It's, it's an incredibly obvious answer, um, but anytime I've tried to learn coding um, and found all of those kind of terms that are used for the different sections of language, and anytime that you try and look up one of them, it's defined with five other terms that you also don't know the meaning of. So it kind of just sends you in circles when you try and look up, but you know, vector and variable and all the different things, all of those. Yeah, I always find the loops of definitions an extra problem. Exactly. So the self-referential community of discourse, whereby uh, each word is defined by another specialised word in that um, community, which actually then, yes, yeah, serve as a... Um, and another form of gatekeeping. I was going to say something entirely inappropriate there. We might say that it's not user friendly and, <laughs> and that it's a result of uh, separate ontologies, <laughs> ontological systems, not interoperable. <laughs> so we're just we're just going to trigger people here for the rest of their lives with these words now, aren't we? Rather than rather than take down any barriers. Oh, one more question. Oh, so one more offer is that we can now vote for our favourite words. Is that right? Is that what Menti's doing? Great. Yeah, so in Menti, go ahead, add your words, think about, yeah, what are some tricky ones that you've come across? As many as you like. We will, we will have a look at them towards the end of this session. So, words that yes. yes, you can use words that have already been discussed or add new words. You can run on your, in your, one of your many open tabs and look at glossaries in digital humanities and scroll and see if you can, it's, but it's also not limited to the digital humanities, anything. Let's, where, where are words that are confusing us? We're now moving on to our second round of fun words. And first up is Linda talking about practice. Thanks, Tully. So, right. Yeah, okay. Have to move okay. Uh, 
This is not very elegant on live TV. Let's, okay, so what we're trying to do is uh, get away from a speaker that might be directly overhead. Um, so what I will do is I'll speak very softly. Um, so practice, my fun word experience is about changing communities from being a professional architect to an academic in a creative faculty. So um, very different to what we've talked about so far. To become a registered architect, you work for two years, then you sit a practice exam through your local practice, architectural practice board. The exam tests your experience of the business of the practice of architecture. So things like quality assurance, contract administration, and that sort of thing. So basically how not to get sued and how not to go to jail. Um, so nothing creative about that certainly not grand designs or architect Barbie. So after, the, after a PhD, I joined a creative faculty and the local lingo was design practice, art practice, creative practice, lots of practices, but no practicing. Um, I also heard a lot about architectural practice and architecture practice, but it kind of always felt a bit wrong, even though it was actually coming from a community of architecture. Um, so after about three years, it finally clicked. Okay, so I'm a bit slow. Um, the locals talking about architectural practice were talking about creative practices, not architectural practice slash how not to get sued. That's because they weren't registered architects, they were academics, and they were transferring the meaning of practice as a repeated performance so using a uh, um, dictionary definition there. Um, so meaning of practice as a repeated performance across to architecture without engaging with the professional terminology. So now I'm talking locally about the differences between creative practice of architecture and architectural practice slash how not to get sued. And it's actually not always welcome. So ref to reflect on this, um, I like the writings of Jackie Swan and Harry Scarborough and their work on workplace knowledge diffusion. Now, I came across their writings when um, uh, at the University of Warwick where I did some study, and that's in the UK, uh, so a different uh, European perspective. Their 2015 paper with Monique Sebro talks about liminal roles in knowledge sharing communities and it's mainly from business, but I think it's useful. They show that there is a need for someone to have the formal role of translator of fuzziness, so as to purposely engage in the liminality that precedes knowledge sharing within multidisciplinary communities. Um, so I suggest that this is not to merge terminologies, but to respectfully acknowledge terminology as part of discipline identity and set up the explicit intermediary processes needed to move projects forward. So a practice of middle way. My feeling is that di digital communities will need more purposeful development of this liminality role to fully realise their potential. Thanks. Any comments on practice? Um, mine is, can you please explain to me the difference between practice-based and practice-led? Uh, not in the time that we exactly. have. Um, um, that, well, we can go back to ontologies. Um, and my understanding is um, it's a different interpretation of how knowledge is created. And so where um, knowledge might be created through an empirical approach, which is what I tend to do, there is an argument within the creatives that um, practice-based or practice-led can use that process of creation and design. And what I'd argue is a wicked, solving wicked problems um, to actually create new knowledge, like big bunch of case studies. Um, and if you want to start a fight, basically you bring that up at the pub. <laughs> awesome. Let's not start a fight. <laughs> Any other comments on practice? We have a diverse group here, one of the things I didn't specify though it came out in our um, biographies, is that we come from all these different disciplines. And so those disciplines all have a different foundation of practice. And so maybe we can just think for a moment about when we are doing 
our humanities, either digitally or in an analog way, what is the practice of that? That's a slightly different meaning to the way that Linda has introduced us to practice, but I think it's worth reflecting that our that when we do digital humanities, the practice at the heart of it is different for all of us. Anyone got a comment? Alexis is worried about the squeaking. I'm looking up at me about to speak. Um, Sorry, it's not really a response to what you said, Tully, right. but it's more um, whenever I hear about it, I think about the the, um, the belief in the oppositional nature of theory versus practice. And I have a you know childhood touch point that my remembering the difference between those is when I first learned to play the piano as a kid, there was theory versus practice. And I can't get past that sometimes when I'm working in the academic sector and I think perhaps I need to, but I also know that the theory versus practice, you know, um, dichotomy or whatever is extremely different in different disciplines, um, particularly when you're talking about Hass and STEM as well. Um, so for me, um, I'd actually say they're not dichotomies. It's actually more a circular process or an abductive process. So you might start off with a theory and in architecture, there's different types of theory. So it might be a design theory versus um, some other theory developed through empirical means. So you might start off that, test it, and then refine it. Um, so they contribute to each other. And it's um, that action of doing design um, creates new approaches to new theories. So constantly having to figure out how to practice our practice and theorise our theoretical practice and practice our theories, etc., leads us to, uh, yeah, a big mess. Yeah. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Next up is Sarah with her keyword, engagement. Oh, my name is Sarah and I'm a training and engagement lead. And I feel like I'm at the AA bit of the AADH conference when I say that. <laughs> um, so I work with academics, but in a kind of technical space. So, and I'm also part of the engagement and outreach team for the Australian text analytics platform. So it's following me. I'm okay with the training bit, but frankly, that engagement word in my job title is a big one. It's slippery and it makes me nervous. And this particular Exercise has been really interesting for me to kind of figure it out. So I tell no lies. I was at a dinner party recently and went through that awkward thing of trying to explain what I do. Research infrastructure is definitely a conversation killer in social situations. <laughs> Try it out. Um, so someone pretty quickly made a joke about me being busy, busy at the Bridal Expo on the previous weekend engagement, blah, 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 and it really did expose that fairly predictable meaninglessness of a word that can mean a range of mostly nebulous things. And I've put the six definitions there, and is it just me or are there actually opposing concepts in here for this one word? Uh, they're from the Cambridge Dictionary, and I added that because it actually made me feel a bit better. So you've got you know, betrothing things and going to war with people. So engagement in the context of agreeing to marry someone is definitely the most concrete, I think, of these definitions in modern times. So it made sense to get there so quickly at that dinner party. But in the meantime, I'm left working in a technical and sort of corporate environment, focusing on researchers and trying to make the sense of everything for them while still figuring it out for myself. For me at work, I think it's a catch-all for a range of things. It's basically about getting attention. That's me yelling out from a Zoom meeting on that megaphone there in the picture. Um, so trying to get people's attention and then somehow turn that into action. But I think it's also about trust building and creating relationships and emotional connections. And there we get back closer to the idea of a romantic engaged to be married idea. Um, but then what of research engagement? Who got the shivers just then, huh? <laughs> and please, please, no one, please mention user engagement, employee engagement and stakeholder engagement. That makes me feel really weird in the tummy. So just to go to the Australian Research Council's idea, they say research engagement is the interaction between researchers and research end users 
outside of academia for the mutually beneficial transfer of knowledge, technologies, methods or resources. But engaged can also mean busy and occupied. And I've been told you engage gears and bits of machinery as well. It's apparently an often repeated term in Star Trek. I swear for research, I found several videos where people have just looped together all of the words engage in a series. So I'm also actually to finally finish, I am Shirley Shaw, it's what is on the lock on the toilet door. <laughs> so which are you, engaged or vacant or what? Any responses to engagement? We can't help but bring up stakeholder engagement now, can we? You've primed us. <laughs> Engagement and impact is the other one. Yeah, yeah they're the same website. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, looking up that AIC Engagement and Impact site, they talk about engagement narratives. There's a search box and it says search engagement narratives. I don't know how you would do that. Like what does that mean? It's prejudice, right? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So what's the difference between a stakeholder and a user? Stakeholder is just a user who's more involved. <laughs> I think stakeholder is a user whose name you might know. No, sorry. Um, I, I think thinking about my context, I think the stakeholder kind of pays for it and the user uses it. But, you know, in, in broader context, there could be a load of things. The stakeholder is kind of anonymous in a way. The user has a kind of specific thing that it's after. Um, yeah, stakeholders is a, a big, big word. I think we should add that to the word cloud. <laughs> our, our final fun word is Diana with impact. Yeah, so Sarah and I have been frequenting the same websites this week, obviously. <laughs> Um, impact is about making a difference. The Macquarie Dictionary offers a range of interpretations, including the influence or effect exerted by a new idea, concept or ideology. And for a sensible discussion of impact in digital humanities, I would recommend recent work by Claire Warwick and Claire Bailey Ross in Jennifer Edmonds' two, uh, 2020 book, Digital Technology and the Practices of Humanities Research. There's a chapter on impact in that. And I also like the formulation that Matt Gold used in his keynote yesterday when he talked about bringing our expertise to bear in the world. I think that's what we're really talking about here. But yes, the Australian Research Council does provide a definition as well. Research impact is the contribution that research makes to the economy, society, environment or culture beyond the contribution to academic research. Impact is important and it is to be expected that a funding body would focus on the effect of the work it funds even for the ARC, however, with a statutory responsibility to support fundamental research, the generation of new knowledge at the cutting edge of human understanding simply isn't enough. And in the glam sector too, impact is much emphasised. Um, it's highly likely to feature in any case for funding a new digitisation project, for example. So returning to Macquarie Dictionary definitions, impact is also defined as the striking of one body against another and forcible contact or impinging. This language is more evocative of a non-academic discourse of impact. It is forced, disruptive, violent and unwelcome. The sentiment is negative. The ARC definition uses the word contribution implying but not quite specifying an emphasis on positive outcomes. But in 2019, the LSE blog explored the notion of Grimpact, thank you, Alexis, <laughs> <laughs> reminding us that while impact is frequently touted as an important and valuable consequence of high quality research, it does have a dark side. The post considered the potentially harmful outcomes of scientific research and also the cynical policy frameworks through which the implicitly optimistic rhetoric of impact is enforced. To conclude then, I argue that the jargonistic quality of the term impact rests less with its capacity to seed confusion and more with its strong evocation of violence, shock and force, notwithstanding its implicit optimism. 
for me, impact invariably evokes slow motion footage of crash test dummies hurtling with balletic grace into the dashboard of a sturdy Volvo. Even those involved in deliberately crashing Volvos have to slow the footage down to make sense what's happening at the moment of impact. Wow. <laughs> oh, Grimpact, there's a good contribution to the, to the discourse, but also you've added another fun word there with dashboard, which is something that we're all, uh, you know, have way too many of in our lives. Any responses to the word impact? We might all be, um, you know, just terrified by the fact that our universities are starting to build up towards their engagement and impact strategies uh, and, and how, you know, yeah, having to collect evidence about this impact, which then seems to obfuscate, as your presentation suggested, Diana, the very, the very thing that we actually strive for. When we, when we do our research. And I think the other thing, particularly for the digital humanities on impact is that we, um, you know, the digital humanities was often uh, expected to be the impact provider for humanities projects, right? The digital was how you could just slip straight towards impact. And so um, that's, that leaves a legacy for the digital humanities to grapple with about where is the location of the contribution to research beyond impact. Anybody got comments on any of those points? Maybe it's not directly, but there's a link sort of. Um, as someone who's, you know, really likes being an advocate for open scholarship, really likes the opportunity for something like the FAIR principles to talk about how we make our, our research more um, efficient, effective, widely received and all that kind of thing. I was really disheartened to learn that the ARC only counts engagement and impact outside academia. And like that's actually, you know, when so much of our work is actually building on each other's advances, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, et cetera, um, I think that's just so disappointing. And at an initial cast of the eye, I feel that there's a perception that that sounds like the, the deck is stacked against the humanities. A very simplistic understanding of that is that, you know, it's when industry pays you money and you make a better engineering thing or a... Um, but I think it's where we have to zero in on where the opportunities are. And that's where that digital humanities, sort of public humanities, public scholarship intersection is. And the opportunity that we have in our area to think more broadly about who the users and the audience and the impact um, and how we can demonstrate impact outside academia as well as inside academia um, and and how we can frame that narrative in a way that in time our funders and our decision makers can understand. Any other comments? Just a final one to say that our um, research officers would say that um, impact inside academia is the excellence part of the process. Um, but there's a problem there, um, which comes back to dashboards, which is that it all all the evidence for that seems to be in the form of citations, which again is sacked against the humanities um, and our ways of working together. Moving on, we have a key question for the audience. Can you share times that jargon has been helpful for you? So first of all, we asked, where has jargon been problematic or caused confusion? Um, but where has it been helpful? While you consider that, I'll say that in the plain English movement, uh, which I referenced in my introductory comments, there's, you know, there's a, there's a view that, you know, that, 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 that jargon exists for a reason. And the example that is often given is that if you've got two uh, surgeons operate, standing over your open um, chest, then you don't want them to be using plain English language for the parts of your body. You want them to use the precise medical terminology because it is a shorthand that enables the discussion to go faster. Shall we, shall we um, cut into this bit or that bit? You want them to be using the precise terms. But when you're then communicating to the public about the inside of one's body, then you, you want to use accessible language. And so sometimes jargon is actually you know called for um can anybody think of examples of of 
one such instance in the digital humanities or the humanities more broadly. Does anyone in the panel? Um, I was going to say, um, in finding other research on the same topic, because often keywords like searches and search engines are better at finding specific words than a kind of cluster of words to explain something. So often if you have a jargonistic kind of term that you can search for, it makes it a lot easier to find other research in the same area or other people who've kind of labelled themselves on Twitter or whatever with the same kind of terms. Absolutely right. So just think about how hard it was to do a um, Google search for the word text in preparing my introductory comments for my, my, my fun word comments um, or the rest of my life when I do um, searches, my, my area of research on Google Books. If you search for, Google, for research around Google Books, you just bring up actual Google Books. So um, yeah, so, so precise terms really do help with searching, um, which is a skill that, uh, that we can all learn better. Others, we've got a comment. Musical terms in Italian. Yeah, it's a good bit. You've outed yourself, um, Alexis, as a, as a piano learner. <laughs> Don't get your expectations up. It was a childhood piano learner. <laughs> Um, but actually, that's a, there are um, numerical values for some of the musical terms in Italian that you use for the speed, the um, the speed of what you're playing, but also, yeah, the the it's a evocation of um, a mode that can be shared amongst a group of people who are experts and specialists in their field. Oh, just to, I guess, um, I like, yeah, fortissimo, pianissimo, they're all really nice words. Um, to kind of, I guess, ping off of what uh, Tess and Tully were, were talking about, you know, computer systems are actually, you know, they're designed so that one word equals one word, right? So they, the jargon actually is a requirement almost for a lot of digital systems which is where you get problems like, what does this term mean? And what means a precise thing? What does that thing mean? Well, it means this, it's a, a function of this other very precise thing. And so um, sometimes that helps us when we're using hashtags or um, trying to find particular things. And sometimes it obfuscates, like when we're looking for Google Books on Google. Um, that's all. <laughs> Any other comments? Where, where, so architecture has a lot of um, jargon. Um, so have you got an example? Well, I'm not sure I'd call it jargon. I'd call it probably the correct words for this specific <laughs> thing. Um, now, I don't talk about, I don't use those, those words when I'm, when I'm at a barbecue or something. Um, but when you're working in practice, you need those correct words because um, they may lead to contractual implications. And also if you're um, then looking at what's happened in the past, so taking a historical perspective, as you might be in digital humanities, you still need to know those, know those correct terms. They've got a history behind them that goes back centuries. Um, and so they're there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no question. I bet if we looked at the um, at the dictionary, jargon doesn't have a negative, um, you know, uh, definition. It's just that how it's come to be used as a word, right? I mean, you know, someone could look up the definition of jargon and and tell us. But I bet it's just, you know, it's just specialized terminology. Is my guess. It's just that we have added the negative connotation to it. I mean, you know, I mean, what are some of the terms that you have stand-up fights, you mentioned, um, you know, practice is one of those. Um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, paratext um, is, a, is one that has a, lots of different understandings of it in, in literary studies. Are there some from your humanities disciplines or glam sector disciplines that, have, that, that people really, really argue over? So just backing up to that question of jargon. It's quite interesting, got the wrong glasses on. So special words are expressions used by a professional group that are difficult for others to understand. So it is actually defined by being 
narrow in who can understand it. It's not negative, but it's specialised. What's the source? Let's have a citation. Oh, oh no, this is Digital Humanity. This is the first thing that pops up in my phone. Is it, but is it Merriam-Webster, which is often the first? Yes. Is that good? <laughs> Fine. I just wonder, what would other dictionaries embed it with that negative or that difficulty? They might. I'm looking at the same definition, but in under archaic form, it says a form of language regarded as barbarous, debased, or hybrid. Stand completely corrected. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I'm a, uh, I work in a library, but I'm not a librarian, and I have a background in museums, and I wouldn't say we have knockdown stand-up fights over it, but I think there's just some firmly entrenched understandings that we think differently about the terms of data and metadata. If you try and get a librarian, librarians are very good with very precise terms for very good reason, because they have a really uh, embedded understanding of the, the whole and their part in the whole. Um, museums, eh, not so much, but we use the same terms. Um, and so, yeah, when you talk about metadata and then you talk about data sharing, people will be sharing their metadata, they'll be aggregating their metadata and call that data sharing. When you're doing analysis, you can do analysis of, you know, is the data um, the the genomic sequence or the full text version of something, or is it the metadata that's nicely organised according to community standards? And I, I think I'm actually always surprised people don't fight about it more. We have a comment in the chat. Interested to hear panellists' thoughts on the joining up of metadata standards and vocabularies and how we solve this as a community. So moving on from metadata to metadata, <laughs> Do you have some thoughts on that? I'm not familiar with the the link that Gavin's put there. Um, I don't. I feel like crosswalking metadata standards is just essentially a professional skill of people who either manage information, and by that I mean sort of information management professionals in archives, libraries, and those sorts, or people who. Um, who do aggregation and, and that sort of thing, and data wranglers um, in the broadest sense of the term. So I'm a bit, I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised as far as I've seen at this Digital Humanities Conference, we haven't had the cartoon that pops up at every single e-research conference from XKCD, which is the person going, we've got 14 standards in this area. We definitely need one more. We definitely need one unifying standard to meet them all. And then the, you know, one year later, we've got 15 standards in this community. So um, I'm a bit, I'm optimistic and hopefully resilient that I go, Meh, aligning these things would be nice, but it's a bit, um, I've got better things to do with my time. <laughs> But that's a really, really shallow interpretation of what Gavin's suggesting there. Anyone else got an opinion on metadata standards and their capacity to be joined up? So coming as a data scientist, I find looking at like the library's metadata is completely different to what I would think of as metadata. There's a lot of different information. And I think it's simply coming from data science mathematics. It's just a lack of knowing how the libraries work. And also that problem of, oh, it's data. And then I realized, no, it's just the metadata about the article. So I think it's just a lack of communication with some um, areas. So yeah, libraries like the metadata is great and it's usually well organized, but it's not what I was expecting as metadata. So yeah, that's my comment on it. Fantastic input, actually. Yeah. And I guess building on from that, I'm going to refer to Katrina's comment in the chat, who says that she finds with students that teaching and demystifying terms like data, data cleaning, ontology can be empowering. So I was going to particularly draw attention to the phrase data cleaning in the middle of that and think about how that is something that looks like magic to those who, you know, it looks imprecise, it looks... It looks um, something that we don't have, we can't see what it is until it is um, um, demystified, um, as Katrina suggests, and then that's an empowering thing because it doesn't look anymore like a magic process. 
that something has to wave a wand over this data set and suddenly it's usable. Um, uh, yeah, does anyone have any comments on data and data cleaning? I thought you would, that's why. Um, yes, yeah, so I find when I talk about my research that a lot of people go, what do you mean about data cleaning? What is metadata? What is data cleaning? What are you doing? Don't you just use the data? So I think demystifying it and explaining what the process is and that actually would help a lot of people go, oh, so that's what's happening. That's why it's important. Um, that's what needs to be done, that sort of thing. So I do think demystifying it's a very important step in both the mathematics, the data science and this digital humanities community. Thank you. Okay, moving then perhaps to um, the Menti reveal were, um, moment. So data and ontology, mm. intangible heritage, bitmap, sustainability, interoperability, minting, big data, machine learning, lab, medium, So would anybody who put a word into Menti care to turn on their microphone and give us some information about why they chose it, how it sits for them in their work or learning? You know, we've, we've just rabbited on about you know, our sense. So this, the stakes are very low here. The standard of communication isn't. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a really slow tweet. Katrina. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Thanks, um, Katrina. Um, I put simple in because it's, it's, I actually had trouble thinking of words that were particularly triggering because it's usually the context that, that makes them triggering. But simple is one that annoys me because I remember sitting at a workshop or something a few years ago and having someone or a group of people say, oh, I only use simple tools. I only write commands into the command line. And I thought, that's not simple. Yeah. That's really hard. Um, and whereas for, they were talking about things like WordPress as, as complex tools because there was so much built into the back end. And I thought, well, but from a student's perspective, you know, say an undergraduate student or, you know, Katrina herself 10 or 12 years ago, WordPress is, is simple because it's a what you see is what you get. Whereas writing into the command line is like a, a weird mystery. <laughs> what goes in there? You know, how do you figure it out? And so I, I yeah, I sort of, um, I have kind of half drafted notes somewhere about this, but that like when we talk about simple tools or simple platforms or simple processes, you know, that they can mean really different things. And what's simple for one person is often incredibly complex for another. Yeah, good point. And what are the hidden curriculum components that make something simple or complex? What are the attendant learnings that somebody has had to uh, experience in order for something to become simple. But then it's invisible. Um, it's not evident to them at the point in which they determine something to be simple. Any other respondents to that? I mean, I don't think it's necessarily just a DH thing, but I think it's a workplace experience thing. And that's one of the things sometimes that comes up working in a library but not being a librarian is I'm a bit prone to um, speaking loosely and I might say, well, I've got all these problems and that problem, that problem, that problem are easy, but these ones are hard. And when I say easy, I mean straightforward. We have problem, we apply this, chat, this response to that problem, the problem will be fixed and then we have 
complex problems that are really hard. And I've tripped myself up and offended co-workers a number of times by saying something is easy that they get all upset, going, oh, you don't understand how hard it is to manage data in a library. And I go, oh, no, I do. I just think if there's a straightforward path from A to B, I call that easy and I shouldn't. And they're probably doing the same as those people are doing by saying simple um, because we've got to be, we've got to always understand um, you, uh, uh, your, um, your, the, the perspective of the person you're talking to. That was really interesting, Katrina. Um, and I, I wonder if they, when people are saying simple, they mean from a, from a programming perspective, which is that the command line is unadorned, right? Um, simple in that sense, rather than simple to, to create, whereas, you know, WordPress has a user interface. So it's, it has more to it. And just as a side note, I teach WordPress to my undergraduates and they do not find it simple. They find it extremely challenging, um, but they got all they get there by the end of the semester. So. Does somebody else want to pick a word that's on that list? Um, concordance jumps out at me. Anybody know anything about concordances? Less than I should. <laughs> My thought precisely. Uh, sustainability. That's a huge, well, I mean, I love that as a, as, a, as a wicked word, as a difficult word, because when we in the digital humanities who, who engage in long-term projects, uh, talk about sustainability, we're talking about how, how is this going to be supported over time? How is it going to exist after this one year grant has finished? But when governments talk about sustainability in funding, they're talking about how are you going to move away from needing funding in order to be self-sustainable for the long term? And that's not a fair um, and applicable thing for, the, for humanities at all. Any other thought? I mean, and then there's the, the version of sustainability that's about environmental sustainability, which is just as important, which is, you know, um, you know, what, how much energy do our um, projects use? Um, how, are, how are server farms, um, you know, affecting, affecting things beyond what we can see? Responses? That's a big one for me. So in terms of environmental and ecological sustainability, versus um, other sustainabilities. I'm literally having to work out who am I talking to and sort of do simultaneous translation to make sure I don't, don't cross the line. It's like, it's like living in the middle of Europe and being on borders and thinking, what, am I, what language am I talking today? Is it French? Is it German? What am I, yeah. what am I today? What, how many different currencies do I have in my wallet? before the year I came in, that is, that is, yeah. Wow, yeah. Um, I like a version of, well, I, I like um, something that I've seen in the DH community in recent years, people pushing back against the notion of perpetual sustainability. Um, I'm heavily, many people would have read an article by James Smithies in the DSH, Think, or no, Digital Humanities Quarterly, um, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, about um, the importance of sunsetting projects, the importance of, you know, if you are creating a digital project, in very few circumstances, does it actually need to last forever? It's, um, it may have impact and influence for a limited period of time. It may lead to advances in other digital projects that then take up that baton and run with it. And that those things need to have a sort of lifespan played out. And it was interesting, I had the lovely experience of being at the Academy of Humanities, Humanities, Arts, Culture, Data Summit, I think 2018 and 2019, or it might be 17 and 18. And there was a real turnaround from one to the other for one, in one conference, every Everybody wanted all of their projects to be maintained forever and how on earth were we going to get the funding to do it? And then actually you saw a lovely, where people were saying, look, how relevant does this need to be for, how long does this need to be relevant for? And related to that, working in the e-research sector, I'm really good, I'm very passionate about the notion of persistent identifiers and sustainability of resources. And one thing that I'm happy to see in the e-research sector, and I think this is nicely led by the people at Paradisic, is divorcing the item of value for 
are the item of sustainable value from the frame in which it is seen. Um, I, Marco La Rosa from one of the Sydney universities described it once as um, pigs versus pens. You want to actually, if you're a farmer, you want to spend your time looking after the pigs, not the pens. And so if you want... Um, Actually, maybe that should go the other way around because the pigs might have a short life. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, what's important in Paradisic is the data, the interface in which we see it will change, will come, might go. You may find a future where the data that Paradisic holds is just emerged into a larger archive. Um, and so what is what really needs to be sustainable and what can live on short-term funding and close at an appropriate time, I think, is a really mature advance that I've seen in this sector in recent years. And, you know, I absolutely agree. Um, do you want to comment, Jenny? Um, that comes down to good metadata. It means bundling your data with appropriate metadata so that that data can then be reused later on down the track, even if it's not accessible immediately through some kind of platform. <laughs> I have many things to say because I think that there is also the need to put to 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 allow for that sunsetting, but also to think about where are the, where where might pressures for that come from. And one of them, which I'll be talking about in my paper after the break, is um, a, a pressure to always towards innovation and never towards valuing maintenance. Um, and so those are two things. I think sometimes we could be led towards. Uh, thinking about sunsetting projects just as a funding um, sort of strategy. That is, there's no more funding, oh, well, let's sunset it. And sometimes um, that's not always the right thing. How do, we, how do we get, how do we look at those projects independent of the politics that always surrounds them in order to determine their future? But we've gotten away from words. <laughs> Um, any, anyone else want to raise another one of those? Open. What does open mean? Oh, Susan, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, I can think of a way to join concordance and sustainability um, and sunsetting. Um, the concordances I use for Greek and Latin are beautiful objects on really fat, always the top floor of the library on multiple fat volumes, so they're printed things um, and they can't, couldn't have been generated without a computer. And often them, they were generated by German firms in about the 1970s. So they lay out the whole text of say Herodotus, a Greek historian in um, you know, four volumes multiply. So they have each word of that whole 100,000 word text on one line with its context of before words before and words after. So the, the concordance word, well, I suppose I don't need to explain to you what a concordance is, but that's a key word in context. They couldn't have been generated without a computer, but there they are on printed material, which is there forever, so long as the libraries keep going. So that's a sort of, I've, I've lost the, the profound thought I was going to make, but you see the idea that the, the, the sun setting was quite appropriate for the, for the publisher's project, which produced them. Um, and we've still got the, the output. Alexa says, good point. <laughs> A good example. So if we don't have any final comments, Data. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, yeah, I tried to draw us out on the question of what is data. I think it's just as, as complicated as what is text. Um, but nobody wants to go there. Okay, Sarah will go there. I'm just going to open a can of worms, but I read recently something about data going back to the kind of Latin origin as being something given. And that we are now in a kind of process or a moment in history where it's kind of taken mm. and we're moving away from that idea of it being something given. And I just thought, oh, isn't that interesting, this whole consumer kind of idea that we have about 
knowledge, whether it's data or other things, but with that whole speeding up and taking and taking and taking. And I just thought, oh, God, that blew my mind. Who says data but is Australian? <laughs> Nobody. Rosie, Rosie says data. <laughs> I'm always interested in that too, just in terms of how we prepare ourselves, like present ourselves. Yeah. Who says data? Sydney. Sydney people say data? I mean, maybe not I say data. You I say data. Yeah. Does data sound daggy? <laughs> I can't even think of which one I say now. What am I saying? <laughs> maybe. Is it a South Australian thing? Data. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I made it a <laughs> cheap. So with that, I think we will draw this session to a close. So thanks for joining us to hear about the way we in this room as a interdisciplinary, intersectoral digital humanities group, I was about to say user group, <laughs> community group, textual group, impactful group, practice in our digital humanities group. Um, Community of practice, perfect, in the digital humanities here in Adelaide, the way that we find ourselves face-to-face -face with those embassy checkpoints between the disciplines, between the sectors, between the backgrounds and understandings, and the way that we as digital humanists can lower the barriers of entry into our community of practice here in this room, but also nationally and internationally, regionally, um, by not making assumptions about the language that we use, by inviting uh, interpretations that we might not have considered for the words that we take as every day, and for being committed to, I, I guess, acknowledging the onus that is upon us to make the digital humanities a space that is for everyone, no matter where they come from, disciplinary wise uh, or sector wise. Uh, and we can do that through the way we interact with language, terms, keywords, and fun words. Thanks for joining us.